Yes, we've got an absolutely tremendous player with tremendous cheekbones this week, Richard. <laughs> How are you doing? Fine. Must I'm say you're looking tremendous. Thank you. How Look, do you do? What's the secret? Looks so deceiving. Somebody told me the secret's carrying your wallet a bit all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that'll be McCoy, so that <laughs> was yeah. McCoy. And also Derek Ferguson. Uh, and By the way, what about him coming? He's in your board, but then I, I spoke to him this morning and he attracted his oh, did he, did he? So <laughs> he did say you're the first uh, player he's ever played on. Yeah, Derek, good lad, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I was fortunate to play with good players, he was one of them. But what is the secret? Is it the yoga? Uh, no. You know, I played till 39 in the Premier League. Um, just always looked after myself so Ray Wilkins said to me at a young age um, your body's your bank look after it because once once the body's not working anymore then it ain't going to be paying you any money um, so I always try to look after myself well and uh, I think I've just carried that on you know to mm. the, into the you know as I got older as well so it's good Rangers captain I know but I've got your biggest achievement down here is the third best looking ginger ever played in the SPL <laughs> You want to know who I'll put you behind? <laughs> I don't know. Everyone says that. But uh, I think it's strawberry blonde, right, actually. Okay. Yeah. You want to know who you're behind? Davy Bowman and Duncan Sheena. All right. Happy with that? Bronze for... Yeah, not bad. No, come All on. Right. You're the best. You're the best. Yeah, yeah. Right, on to the football, Richard. Born in Sweden and grew up in South Africa. Yeah. How did you find yourself at Dundee United? Um, born in Sweden. My dad was from Hillington. Um, just up the road here and um, met my mom down in London she was a Swedish girl come over as a nurse in London bet she was tremendous wasn't she yeah I think she was <laughs> yeah she was a good looking lady good looking lady with the cheekbones maybe that's oh, where the cheekbones she'd have been all over yeah. her yeah you would have <laughs> um, and then my dad played for the British Army and um, we went out to, he got taken out of the army by Charlton Athletic so he played for Charlton for maybe a season and then immigrated out to, to Johannesburg um, in 1965. Mm. So uh, that's, how I, that's how we landed up there. What, what position did he play? He was a defender as well. Centre half? Uh, right back, right half, right, you know, centre back. But I so can remember as a young boy him telling me, do you want to kick people or be kicked? I said, oh, I think I'd rather kick people than be kicked. So I was always a defender just from watching him. And, you know, I like defending, you know, I really... I used to enjoy defending. Mm-hmm. What kind of player was he that since he played? Was he quite tough on you? Would he give you advice? Well, he did, yeah, he was very tough. Typical Scottish uh, father, you know, really disciplined. And being a soldier, he was a paratrooper, my father. So being a soldier, I grew up in a very um, disciplined household, a uh, very pretty strict household. But the one good thing he did, and maybe that's what I should have mentioned about the fitness, was I used to go running with him, you know, every morning from about eight years old you know so did you every morning you go for yeah, a run with your dad yeah because he was still playing so he just wanted to keep fit and he just he pulled me out of the bed and just go for a run so that discipline that he set stayed with me for a long time do you think that made you a player then I think so because I'm a you know like a lot of people say I was I was very talented and obviously I had good talent but I think the the my fitness was um, uh, was a big part you know, I was a good athlete, you know, and, and, and as the game changed, you had to be a good athlete, otherwise you couldn't play. Mm. Um, so I think that uh, had a huge, you know, impact on me growing up and also a desire not to give up, you know. Is it true that you went to Rangers at 18 but weren't taken on? Yeah. I mean, you know, my, my uh, you know, from, um, from, from a young age, I came over at 15. You know, I went with my best friend to, to, to Ipswich. We right. as like 14 year old kids or something, you know, to Ipswich. And um, <clears throat> then I landed up at Charlton and I did a year at Charlton as, a, as an apprentice professional. But I got homesick because um, I came from a tennis court and a swimming pool in the backyard in Johannesburg. So I missed all that. Um, and then I came to, to Rangers. I had a trial at Rangers, <clears throat> Dundee United and um, Aberdeen. I came to Rangers, played really well. And you know as a kid when you play well, so you played really well. I never played well very much. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew I kind of, kind of a level, the same level as the boys at, at uh, you know, Ibrox at the time. And, um, but, you know, they had a lot of players. John Gregg informed me they had a lot of players in my position. I went up to Jim, 
to, to Dundee United and had a trial at Dundee United. And Walter Smith played left back that night in a, in a reserve game at Gayfield. And I was hopeless, Simon, honestly. Right. I, was, I was poor because I was gutted that I never signed for Rangers. And uh, Jim McLean gave me a 10 year contract, you know, about 20 <laughs> quid a week. <laughs> See, when you were having a, a nightmare that night at Gayfield, was, was oh, Walter Smith slaughtering it? Did you slaughter me from life? Yeah, part, or was I, th- you right I think I think what got me the job was I was slaughtering Walter Smith. I was a seventeen year old. Yeah, yeah, he was. Did you always have that as well, Richard? That I don't know. I was always a captain of my teams from from a young age, so maybe um, no, or maybe that. Anyway, I didn't play very well, but they must have saw something, you know, and um, signed me. And uh, what was your first impressions of uh, Jim McLean? As you say, you came from quite a privileged background <sighs> to me in this nutcase. Yeah, no, no. Um, he was a genius, McLean. I mean, um, I'm not sure if he could have managed in today's world because a lot of the managers around about that time, Sir Alex Ferguson included, Jim McLean, it was a kind of bullying culture, I would have called it, you know? And it was for me, it was fine because I grew up not with a bullied father, but with a very disciplined, you know? So if someone shouted at me, um, I would just say, you know, I'll show you the next time type thing, you know, mm. it wouldn't really bother me too much. Um, but um, I'm sure those those managers lost a lot of flair players, I would call them, you know, yeah. they couldn't really handle the, um, the criticism. But I think in that, during the early 80s, they did that because I think it separated, you know, the, the wheat from the shaft yeah. type thing, you know, so the, the really strong characters came through. came through and the weaker ones didn't. Can you remember the first time you roasted you properly? Mr. McLean. Yeah. Um, I was. Nah, I wasn't. It wasn't too bad. I can remember other. You know, I, one of my first games that I played for Dundee United. I was on the bench, and I was only seventeen, eighteen, and he took Eamon Bannon off after nine minutes. Wow. Yeah. And he put me on. I said, "Well, where, where must I go?" He went, "Just run up and down midfield." You know. I said, "Well, not really midfield. You'll be fine." took Bannon off because Bannon blanked him a couple of times he was shouting at Bannon on the Eamon the Bannon what was he called Eamon Bannon yeah you know and Bannon just giving him a deaf ear right and he just went like well get him off and I was like uh, you know I was like 10 minutes in you know so it was like no one no one mucked around with McLean you know with none of the as a old... reporter found out later oh, on that you guy know? Head button, uh-huh. yeah he smacked and he punched him or something uh-huh. you know so um but he was great. Jim McLean was uh, brilliant for my uh, and working under Walter Smith. Yeah. So what know, was it was so good about him? What was so great about him? Have you had this the other side? Thing? He was just. He was a, like I said. I think he was ahead of his time. He really was ahead of his time. I I went up for a Dundee United Hall of Fame dinner. You know, I eventually got into the Dundee United Hall of Fame <laughs> about three years ago, and I went up for a dinner, and a lad called Andy McLaren. Uh, who was getting inducted? Uh, Andy's been on. Andy's United. been on here. Huh? Oh, great what guy! A guy yeah. Good, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant guy. Um, he had said to me, "Oh, so one of my first games, Goffey he says um, Jim McLean says to me, um, at our corners, at Dundee United's corners, you mark Richard Goff." And Andy McLaren went, "What are you talking about?" He said, "Just stop him heading the ball away. Don't want." But Andy McLaren says, "No, but I'm trying to score." You know, he says, nah, don't you worry about that. <laughs> Just stop him heading that away. Wait. So I was like that, put, you know, the seed in my head, you know, because you, I just, I didn't use to mark anyone. I just used to go, just and, attack the ball. go and attack the ball. Yeah. Everyone else could mark. I would just go and say, I'm going to head the ball away. So I thought, ah, he was brilliant, McLean. I thought, so but uh, it's something different. Uh, stop, yeah, stop, just stop going from Just it. stop him heading it and we'll try and other, our other ones will try and score. You know? That tells you how good Andy was nah. and that was his job. <laughs> I didn't want to say that to him. I said, how are you get in the Hall of Fame? You marking me at your own corners, Andy. Oh, <laughs> uh, bro. But see, development-wise, did he yeah. bring your game on? Well, at 17, 18, I was, I was getting homesick again. So I can remember Christmas, oh, Christmas, um, Christmas Day, uh, it must have been 1981, I just went into Walter Smith. I said, I'm off. I've, I've had enough. What I didn't know, my father told me later, was McLean was finding my father every day. Because I, when I came back, my father was disappointed. He just kicked me out of the house as well, down at Durban or something. So I just, he was disappointed. He never said too much, but he was disappointed. Um, and McLean was phoning them every day and said, listen, this boy will play for Scotland before he's, 20, before he's 21. Wow. Yeah. 
And my dad said to me, he called me one one day, and I was, you know, I was happy. I was, I was actually going to go and join the South African Army or something uh, with all my mates. You know, you're that that age, 17, 18, you know. So my dad spoke to me and said, "Listen, go back and give it another chance. And if you don't like it, then come back." So I came back. I hadn't been in Scotland for six weeks, and he put me right in the first team at left back. And I was never out of the first team again from oh. 18 on, you know. Would he say these things to you? To your face so that you think she could play for Scotland Jim McLean would, would, would there never be any praise? No, no praise. And did you like that? Yeah, I was fine with that. You kind of knew as a player, I knew as a player. <clears throat> I played left back, right back, central defender, you know. Um, you know, when we, when we ended up getting the title that year, I played the last four games of that year as a central defender and he put David Nery in the middle of the park, you know, so I always knew that was my ideal position, mm. you know, as a central defender. That's what I always played in. Because uh, for our viewers, like you say, United doing the league scene seems inconceivable. What it was is. it about that team that was it so is. good then? You know what, I think you could, you could in those days, uh, Simon, you could uh, keep a team together, you know. And, um, well, Jim certainly could. Huh? <laughs> he certainly could. But you kind of had the teams together for about four or five years, I thought, you know. And um, that team, you know, had Hamish McAlpine in the goal was... You know, he was a bit of an ex, you know, extrovert, but he was he was a good goalkeeper. With his feet, he was brilliant. You know, he was very good. He would have suited today's game perfectly. Um, myself, David Neri, Paul Hegarty, Malpass. It was a very strong wow. back four. It was a good back four. Um, you know, midfield, Bannon, you had Bannon, you, you know, you know had a good team. Starak, Mull and Dodds up front. So we had very, very strong team, especially... Um, we used to have a very attacking team. There was a lot of pace in the team. You know, Billy Kirkwood was a setter, John Holt, uh, Starkey. So we had a really good side, you know. Um, and if you think of that team, we, we reached the European Cup semi final. We reached two European UEFA Cup quarterfinals, which we should have got through maybe two of those, but um, we, were, we were a good team. Was there always a belief in that dressing that you could compete with your, the top European top clubs? Um, you know, it's about good players, Simon. I always think it's about good players, and that that football club just had good players at that at that period of time. I mean, I left in um, August eighty six, nineteen eighty six, and United went on that year to to get through to the the UEFA final that year mm. against Gothenburg. And if you tell young kids of today that we were in a Champions League semi final, you know, Dundee United, they go, you know, you can't really Crazy. believe that. But that that was down to McLean keeping a really Good squad of players together and uh, and good players. Uh, you played Rome in the semi final, won the first tie at Tannadice 2 0. How special a night was that? It was good. Um, we had a good team as well. I had uh, Graziani, the wee boy, we, we left wing, I can't even remember his name. Um, but they had a very strong team, um, beat them 2 0. And their chairman came out and said, We were all on drugs, we ran around so much and everything, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can remember flying out there and we Jim says, remember when you come off of the when you come off the plane, don't say anything to the press. And he had a right go. He came off the plane and said, went the mental, you know. And yeah, that's yeah. why they try to punch him after the game and everything. Try to punch Jim, did they? Huh? Yeah, came after yeah, there was there was a lot of problems after the game. Did you was but it you that asked him to punch Jim? <laughs> <laughs> Could it be that none of us were, none of us were helping him anyway? <laughs> and you got it. <laughs> we're off. No, uh, but the second but we leg. got beat three 0 We got beat three 0 and they had a good team. They had Falcao, they had Cerezo from you know Brazilian boys, and uh, but they're not coming. The director had tried to bribe the referee. referee. Yeah, but you know they had a good enough team. They didn't need that, and I think the referee was a guy called Vutro. But I don't think that happened. Or, he, or someone else took the money off the chairman and just <laughs> and bolted. You know, I don't think the trail got the money, you know. So, yeah, we were just a wee bit inexperienced at the time, you know. Do you think you could have beat Liverpool in the final? Or would that have been a step too far? I think it would have been a step too far as well. I mean, you know, yeah. they had Sunus and, you know, they had a they proper had a, team. They had, a, they had a great team around right about, you know, Kenny, mm. around right about that time as well. That would have been. See, fantastic, see being 2 0 in the first leg and then losing 3 0 with, with Jim, I went mental after the game, it is. No, I think it was, I think it was a bit shell shocked that people were trying to punch him after the game. But um, yeah, I can remember Ralphie Mullen having a chance in the game. But other than that, they battered us, you know. Mm. I think you know 
I was in their stadium, you know, I was in the stadium. The final was in their stadium as well. So I think if they did four, they might have got four. four. You know what I mean? It was one of those, you just kind of think, you know. They're always going to win. Yeah, it was one of those games, I thought, mm, you know, so. But it was a great experience. And I'm thinking, like I won the league when I, I just turned 21 when we won the league. So I'm thinking, this will kind of happen every year, you know. I mean, this is, this is, this is what will happen. This is the norm, huh? This is the norm. You know, reaching finals, reaching cup finals, reaching winning the league, you know. So that was the first league, you know, the first trophy I got, and I got it early, so it was good. How did that feel to win the SPL at 21? Um, normal, normal, because I was just doing a good team. You know, we yeah. had a good Dundee United reserve team, won a lot of stuff, and it felt good, you know. And then Aberdeen had a very good team at the time, uh, you know, very strong, and that, because they managed to keep their players together as well. Um, and I used to have a habit of scoring against Aberdeen as well. Um, so I just um, think the standard of football was good. Rangers weren't that good at them that time, but Celtic had a good team. Celtic had Charlie Nicholas, uh, you know, some good players as well, you know. Mm. See, when you win the league, would Jim have a pint with us? No. Never? No. Did you just get a well done? I think we went down to Frank Coppel, who was, a, who was an old ex Dundee United player. We went down to his house after the, we won the league and. Walter was there, I can remember that, but uh, no, we no, no. Jim, he was old sitting school. in the house, yeah, and he's be padded cell. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. See, when you got to that European level and you obviously were playing really well, did you think the time's come for me to move on then? Um, I think that you know, because I was a young boy and I was, I'd been playing right back at Dundee United, so um, a very attacking right back, I must say, because oh, yeah, yeah, I just use a bomb forward all the time and just, just. I was a good athlete, like I said, so I'd, I'd, I'd get forward at the back post a lot and create a lot of danger coming in, you know, because Sturrock and Bannon, once they got it on the, the left-hand side, you know, I would just go ghost, for, in. ghost in and Billy Kirkwood would sit for me. And it kind of was just a thing. I was good at that. I was good in the air, so I just used to do and I got, I think that league season, I scored 10 goals from fullback. Back. Yeah, from fullback, yeah. What a player. Jim McLean does not let anyone leave Dundee United. So why did you get to leave? Because I told him I was going to retire again. I I put a gun to his head, more or less. Um, well, you just said you would chuck it. Yeah, I said I was going back to South Africa and chucking it. Because um, you know, you used to know at that time there were you know, there were there wasn't agents really really by that time, but newspaper people would phone you up. When I had this old this boy called Jim Roger, who was uh, the doyen of Scottish newspapers at the time. He was like, like, a, like a, an agent, and he would say, you know, you know, Tottenham want you or whatever. And so I knew there was an offer, a big offer from Tottenham sitting on the table, but Jim McLean was refusing to phone them back or something like that, you know. So I just went in, and just said, well, I know there's an offer there, and then I'm off. See, that guy hadn't told you that with Jim, and not even told you about Spurs. Wouldn't have told it. Yeah, I wouldn't have got to hear about it. So that guy's basically made your career. In a lot of... In Did you ever sort of it? No. Okay. Of course not. <laughs> was it a, was I've it never it? had an agent in my career. My <laughs> agent, you no. My agent was Sir Alex Ferguson. If I needed a problem, I just phoned him up. Oh, brilliant. So that was my best agent. So was there an argument with Jim when you left, or was it...? No, so I spoke to the directors, but the board, I said, I'm, I'm off, you know. So got a, got a call from the chairman of Dundee United saying, listen, we want you to play the game against Rangers on the Saturday because our league had started before Spurs, the league. He says, and then you can go. So it was quite funny because um, we, we, we played at Ibrox, lost the game. I go back on Saturday night. I still haven't heard anything. Jim McLean was not he was speaking to me and I know I'm leaving the next morning to go down to London to, to sign for Tottenham. I get a call from, when I get back to Dundee, I got a call from... Uh, George Grant, who was the chairman of Dundee United, said, um, um, "You can um, I've got a wee problem, Richard. Tottenham, uh, Tottenham have put seven fifty. Chelsea have matched their offer." He says, "So we need to go and see the both of them, both teams." So I says, "Fine." So um, I said, uh, "But I still not heard from Jim McLean." So I called me Jim up. And I said, you know, to get a bit of advice. Mm -hmm. So I said, Mr. McLean, I just want to thank you. I'm leaving tomorrow morning. I just want to thank you for all the, all the help you've given me, you know, throughout my 
five years at Dundee United um, and a bit of advice on, on should I join Tottenham or Chelsea? And I knew I was going to join Tottenham. He says, well, I don't really bother who, you, who the, the <laughs> F you're going to fucking sign. <laughs> Fuck off. And put the phone down. I was like, I couldn't believe it, you know what I mean? That's brilliant. <laughs> He's brilliant, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's how he was, you know? <laughs> Like you know, like not, not like you know, good luck with the rest of your career, son. <laughs> oh, fuck off! I don't care. You join, bang. You know, so that was it. So um, I go down. I went down to Tottenham, and I knew I met Irvin Scholar and David Pleat. They they were waiting for me, you know. So and it was it was great because I said, look, gentlemen. I said I'd, I'd love to sign for you. I said that I was 23, 24 at the time, so I, was, I wasn't a kid. But I said, you know, I really need to phone. Ken Bates, who's the manager or uh, who's the chairman, chairman of, Chelsea. of Chelsea, just to say, look, I don't want to waste your time. I'm not coming. And Irvin Scholar says, are you sure you want to do that? I says, yeah. I says, that's, a, Here we are. that's the adult thing to do, yeah. you know? And he says, okay. He says, because I'd, I'd rather make that call, you know? I said, no, 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 I can do it. So I phoned Ken Bates. He says, I'll get Mr. Bates on the phone for you. I said, Mr. Bates, Richard, go off here. He says, look, I don't want to waste your time and come all up across London to West London and because uh, I'm signing for Tottenham. Ah, fuck off, you Scottish bastard. You know? <laughs> Ken Bates, I'm done, you know. So there was two calls. <laughs> so they were from Jim the Crane and Ken Bates. They were both of them crackers, you know. Oh, they didn't even get late. Not late, yeah, it's not late. All the best for your career, so thanks for phoning, you know. That's brilliant, isn't it? I just oh. like, the school was like that, yeah, you know, like, laughing, you know? Oh, brilliant. Hey, know. How different was the standard at Spurs compared to the United? Was it quite um, easy for you because you'd been playing with top players? Yeah, but um, one of my first, and then, then I'm right in, because I'm right into the game, first first game, you know. I'm, we played Aston Villa, and um, I go into the dressing room. And uh, Gary Mabbitt's injecting himself. He's my... Uh, Diabetic, wasn't it? Huh? Yeah, he's my... I'm like, oh my God, what's going on here? He's in the toilet. And he says, it's all right, it's all right, Richard. I'm like, is it... He must have seen plenty of that in Dundee, but it was definitely injecting there. <laughs> Maybe now, not then, but then. But um, Glenn Hoddle said to me um, when I came, Glenda, as he was known, you know, he said, um, played against you three or four times, Richard, in the England team, Scotland. He says, you're a good passer of the ball. Um, when you get it, just look for me. And I said, well, well, why is that? He says, because cause I'll be free. And I went, oh, right, okay. I said, so you don't run back with anyone then? Oh, no, I don't do that, son, you know? Oh, no, I, went, I went, perfect. <laughs> so I nicked, I nicked off the Aston Villa set of forward. I looked to him, he was hiding behind the, the midfield. I dinked one into him and he's just put it through to Clare Allen without even looking, you know, on the volley. 1 0, you know. And I'm thinking, oh, you wow. know, quality. Quality. And I always tell people, you know, when I look at centre backs now and they give it to their midfield players standing right next to them, you know, I said, I only gave it to one person. You know, from as a centre back, you know, and it was Glenn Hoddle because he could do something yeah. that I couldn't do. Because Hoddle the best you played at? Yeah, I put him in my best ever team. And my best, and my two central midfield players was um, Paul Gas, uh, Glenn Hoddle, and Graham Sooners. I just did a Rangers team the other day. Right. Uh, not a Rangers team, the best ever team. Yeah. And. Um, Casco has just been up, hasn't he? You know, he says, I see, I see I wasn't in your team. Go off here. He's seen it, didn't he? Yeah, <laughs> he's seen it. Pulled I knew. <laughs> and he goes, uh, I said, well, I had to put Hoddle and Sooners in. I said, I, I couldn't put you ahead of him, Paul. I'm sorry, you know. He says, don't worry. He says, I'll put Mabbit in, in instead of you for the tournament. <laughs> <laughs> he's quite happy, you know, because I don't want to upset Casco, you know. Uh, but Hoddle was the best. I've said, I as, love as, that a, Hoddle, just pass it as a player, as a player, he was... Um, you know, I love Sunus as a player and, and Gascoigne, I always say, Gascoigne was a player, if you needed someone to win you a game. He you could know, produce a moment of magic. Uh, yeah, he was the one that, you know, if your life was on the line. Mm. But as a player, one of the, you know, the best players, and I was lucky enough to play with so many good players. But the best player I played with was, was probably, and I only had a season with him. Right. And he only had a season with me. And he funny enough put me in his best team as well. So he obviously rated me a wee bit. Yeah. But he was the best, I'd say. Brilliant. Glenn Hoddle, what a player. Just, just 
just could see things other people couldn't see, you know? Because yeah. I always used to say to him, I would always argue with him and say, I'd give him a ball with five minutes to go and keep it, Glenn. And he try him. He would try the thing, right? And I would go, Glenn, Glenn that, you know, you know, keep it, man. You know, it's like two minutes to go, you know? And he says, if that goes through, Richard, it's 2-0. <laughs> <laughs> you know? What I, mentality. Uh, I don't know, so, like today's game, he would, his stats would be poor because his, he may only have 30%, but the 30% were goals, you know, oh, yeah. because every ball he Can was... Can I get players like that now today? No, but every ball was a... You know, just a side was, but every ball was... He was trying, trying to... create a goal? Yes. Love it. I know, so the strikers were like, oh, boy. <laughs> and they, if they ran, they knew it was coming right. Right on their toe. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, you lost the FA Cup final in 87 to Coventry. Yeah. Do you look back oh. on that spell bittersweet? Yeah, I do. Yeah, should have won the game. Yeah, but we were so confident. Um, I remember Ozzy Ardilas coming into the room because we had a great team: Hoddle, Waddle, Ardilas, wow. um, Mabbitt, You know, Clive Allen had scored forty nine, and we had a fantastic team. Um, we Ozzy used to come into my room and uh, take two whiskies from the bar, the miniatures, two whiskies, you know, at the bar, and have his fags on the Friday night <laughs> because he that. knew he knew. <laughs> He knew I wouldn't get pulled for taking the whiskeys, and the manager knew it wouldn't be me. So, I was, you know, but if it was his room, he would get pulled. You know, but he used to come into my room. Was he a, was he a genius as well? Genius as well. And I used to argue with him all the time, and he'd just go, How many World Cup so oh, winners' well, medals you got? <laughs> End of argument. You know what I'm saying? Right? But we played that day, and the morning of the game, they had a boy, a right winger called Bennett, a black lad called Bennett, right. who's a good player, you know. And he said, a big headline. I love playing against Mitchell Thomas. That was our left back that day. And I, I went, I just went to Mitchell's room. I said, have you seen this article? He loves playing against you. I said, first minute, just put him in. Rose Ed. Rose Ed, you know. So for, they, they throw the ball out to him the first minute. And Mitchell jockeys him right back to the edge of our 18-yard box. And he chips it in for Regis and Houchin. There's a boy called Houchin who played up at Hibs as well. He was a good player as well, a big tall boy. And Regis, I think, headed it over the bar. So, well, this is going to be a long day here, yeah. you know? You know, so we should have won it, but we never. But, um, yeah, it was, a, it, was a good, it was a good season at Tottenham. Was that one of the disappointments of your career? Biggest disappointments of your career? Well, yeah, been? yeah, it would have been, yeah. yeah. Was, I had a few. I didn't have many huge disappointments, but that, that was one of them, yeah. yeah. Uh, why did you leave Spurs then? Were you keen to get away or did you want to stay? No, I signed a, I signed a, a five-year contract, right, the in that summer. Um, but, um, you know, as soon as, Graham had always been on the phone to me, we were friends, you well, know. While you were playing at Tottenham, Graham would be phoning you, huh? Well, you Just know, for a catch-up and stuff like just that. Just a catch-up. <laughs> just a catch-up. But when you're coming back, I'll be like, off it, you know. <laughs> but it was, a, you know, just a catch-up. And, and Walter Smith as well. Walter's a, a friend of mine as well, you know, so. Um, Would it only have been Rangers that you'd have left Tottenham for then? Because of Souness and, and Walter Smith. Yeah, and, and Rangers, you, you, you know, it was a strange time in that time, Simon, because the English clubs were banned from Europe. Right. So it was an, an, an anomaly, really, that we were managing, Rangers managed to get all the best English players. We had like half the English team during that period. So, you know, it was kind of like, I'd, my, wife, my wife's father from Dundee had just passed away you know, the previous year. She was up in Dundee quite a bit, up visiting up with her parents, yeah. looking off their mother. So there was a few things that came together. Rangers also put in a bid and uh, that doubled Rangers, that doubled the money. I mean, it was 1.5 million pound for, for a central defender at that time. First ever player to go for a million which, which was unheard of, you know. There was, I mean, that was a record, I think, that stood for a couple of years. Um, so I, I, I'm always, I'm always said if, you know, you know if, you, if they, if Tottenham come to me and say, we've accepted an offer for you, then I'll come and speak to you, you know. So I was a captain at Tottenham. So oh, yeah, captain at Tottenham as well, yeah. Yeah, I was, you know, Ray Clemens gave me the armband in about January of my first year there because he was a captain then, and he just took us. That's where I knew to have senior players run the dressing room. He took the armband off in the game that new year, and he just. He threw it to me right in front of David Plead and said, you'd you're, you're be the captain. Brilliant. Yeah. What an era that is. He's proper football players. Proper football players. And he was a proper, 
he was one of the goalkeepers that I learned more about defending from than anyone else. Why, just talking you through games and stuff like that? Yeah, uh, talking. And I always just try to say my goalkeepers, you know, talking and where to hold my line as a defender. Don't come into the box, otherwise I'm going to break your jaw. You know, I was like, <laughs> what? Did I hear that right? <laughs> I said, okay, so I kept everyone right on the edge of the box. Uh -huh. He says, then I can come and catch it. You know, there's no one there. He says, you come, if you come back, and I see teams coming back into their box, you know, just little things. And you could, hear him, you could hear him all the time from, from a long way back, you know, it's on your left shoulder, right shoulder. Right. You know, it was, it was great. That's it's true. Great. It's older players that you learn the game from, isn't it? Absolutely. Wee bits of nuggets that they give and, you. Uh -huh. Yeah. You know? So, uh, first ever player to go for yeah. a million Scottish player. Bang balance must have been looking magnificent. Eh? <laughs> Is that when you thought I've I've made it then? It was it was good because um, Graham Sooners took a lot of pressure off me. I mean, one point five million pound, you know, which was a record that stood till Gary Pallister, I think, went to from Middlesbrough to Manchester United, United right? I think ninety one or whatever it was. <clears throat> so, um, Sooners said, "This boy will play for our club." for 10 years and it'll cost our club £150,000 a year. That was, looking at it, it was a good way of looking at it. It took a lot of pressure because all the press were like, you know, 750 last year is a right button, you know, and I, you know, so it took a lot of pressure off me. Um, but I came up and I never had an agent. I had a lawyer I came up with and, I, and uh, went to, um, landed in Edinburgh that morning. It's October the 2nd, October the 3rd, 1987. And uh, my wee Jewish uh, lawyer said, uh, showed me the front page of the Daily Record, you know, golf signs for Rangers, you know, blah, 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 you know. He said, they made a mistake there. He says, you yeah, haven't signed at all. I says, oh, no, I, I, you know, I have to, I have to sign it. Yeah. He says, yeah, we'll be signing, but they can't, let, they can't let you leave Glasgow without signing it. Because it's on the front, so you can ask it for whatever you want. Yeah, so... I said, I'd already kind of agreed stuff, you know, with Graham. So um, David Holmes was in charge of the club. It was a good wee story. David Holmes was in charge. And, and anyway, they, they had a wee chat and, you know, as soon as went mental because he was in the room. Because when he seen me, he gave me a big hug and we <laughs> and, and, uh, and the wee lawyer said, oh, you know, uh, it's not, you know, we've got a few things. Tottenham have given us another offer, you know, so we have to, you know, what a man to be Jewish guy, eh? Brilliant. <laughs> and as soon as was gone mental, Greg was gone mental. And his last words were, you better be worth every fucking <laughs> penny. <laughs> because David Holmes asked him to leave the room. <laughs> no, did he? Yes. What, because he was that angry? Yes. He was gone mental. Oh, brilliant. Eh? I know, David Holmes said, Graham, leave the room. <laughs> I mean, that was his last word. You better be with every fucking penny. You know? were, were you worried about playing for Sooners because he was your mate, though? Was there that extra pressure because he was your pal? I mean, he wasn't a pal, but he was, um, you know, he wasn't a pal, but he was like someone I looked up to, yeah, you know. Yeah. So you didn't want to let him down, you disappoint know. Disappoint him, Dis yeah. Yeah, dis disappoint him in any way. And he was a crazy manager, you know. I mean, I mean Koistri will tell you, Alistair, a great friend of mine, tell you, he didn't really. <laughs> They didn't gel perfectly together. Yeah, he, you he know? said that on here. He said that on yeah, camera. He didn't yeah. gel, but I mean, he had he would have had that utmost respect for him. You mm. know? Um, but maybe you know, question was a little bit too, you know, lippy for him, or you know, quick, yeah. you know, like quick with it. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, stuff like that. Soon as didn't like all that stuff, you know. So, but he knew Alistair was a good player, you know. But um, yeah, it was great. And then, you know, he revolutionised the football club. So, mm. you know, we come up, first year was a wee bit um, tricky and we never got the title. Um, Terry Butcher broke his leg. Uh, players, it was like a, you know, it was like a circular door. There was just people coming in and out and it was, you know, because if you didn't like someone, you would sign someone and then go two weeks later, we'd go, uh, oh, by the way, just you keep renting, don't buy yourself a house. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know like, Jimmy Nichols said that to him. Like so he was like, he would just get rid of them. Eh? You just get rid of them. But he was, he was ruthless. You know, he was, he was, he was really ruthless. But which as a player is actually okay. You know, I mean, honestly, yeah, that's what you want. Yeah, yeah. Don't, uh, you're looking for a house? <laughs> maybe, maybe stop that. Imagine you in the mix of looking for a house and he tells you. To I know stop. he tells you to stop looking. <laughs> 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 you've been in the hotel another until I get ready. <laughs> like what? 
Brilliant. You know, there was a few, and, and a few people had to go to and you know, and, um, and they were off. They See that first year, did you struggle with the demands of Rangers? Could, even being at big clubs like Dundee United, no. the league, Tottenham, who Tottenham. was a big club, but was the demands a lot higher at Rangers than it was yes. at Tottenham? Absolutely, because if you lost the game, it was a disaster. My first game, we lost. My first game at Ibrox um, uh, was a 2 2 game against Celtic. And like you say about Scottish football, I, I, you know, it's like chaos, you know. We were 2 0 down, and we had nine men. We had nine men on the field, you know. It's like, what's going on? Yeah, well, I done, yeah, coming up to that. Then uh-huh. I scored, I set Koisty up for one, and mm. then scored to equalise it in the, in the 90th minute. Um, so, yeah, it was a good way to start. Was the atmosphere nothing like you'd seen before? No, nothing like I'd seen it, you know. Did I mean, it, did it, were you going to get nervous about Did that scare you, that atmosphere? No, did you I never got it? nervous about playing. I was always confident of my own ability. But, um, but I like to get nervous, you know, before the game. Not nervous, but, you know, Excited. butterflies yeah. flying, you know. Because I thought, you know, if you've never had those, you never had an edge to your game. Um, I loved, I loved playing against the biggest games. Mm. You know, that was... That was what drove me really. Yeah. How do you think Sunez balanced the uh, player manager role? Um, not uh, not great, not great. I mean, he was he was he was brilliant. I mean, we we won it. I mean, Andy Gray. I don't know if you've had Andy Gray on this. This he tells me a story. He says that um, him and Davy Cooper had been the subs most of the, the season in eighty eight eighty nine when we were going for the treble, and uh, we play Celtic at Hampden. You know just to finish a treble off. And Andy had scored two at Dens the Saturday before. And soon as names a team, Andy Gray says, well, he names a team, but in those days there were only two subs, you know? So he goes, and the subs will be me and Davy Cooper. And Andy Gray turned a job out. He's me, me? <laughs> he said him. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Been the sub the whole season and he's named himself as <laughs> sub at the front. <laughs> and he went, Just patched that big you know, he went, Oh, I've never won a Scottish Cup final medal. I think I'll try and get one today. <laughs> and himself as a sub. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, man. <laughs> I know he's brilliant. Well, I want to ask you because I love the story you told me before we came on about how you would try and get an opposition player's head when you were at Rangers as well. Yeah, and Rangers are buying players like Duncan Ferguson. Yeah, Duncan. You know, Duncan. Duncan was great. You know, I mean, it's unfortunate what happened to him at, at Rangers. You know, but I can remember um, we were going to obviously try and sign him. You know, and he was a young boy. He's I don't know, seventeen, eighteen. I don't know, eighteen, nineteen, but. On his day, he was unplayable, mm. Ferguson. He really was. Handful. Oh, so ball comes, first goal kick. He's come across me, he's elbowed me, I think, put a couple of stitches. And I says, listen, if you do that again, son, you ain't getting a Rangers football club, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I says, whatever you do, you don't score against us. You'll never come in here. So that was, oh, sorry, Richard, sorry. Fucking, <laughs> just walking about like in a straitjacket for the rest of the game. And me, Jim, seen me talking to him, so he knows what's happened, you know? Shattered at first. Ferguson! <laughs> the best, like, the, the Ferguson story I tell all the time was in 92, we were in, um, in uh, for Scotland. It just broke into the Scotland team. And we're in uh, Canada before we go to the European Championships. And uh, I've got, I've got McCoist, McCall, Gorham, McPherson, myself, there was five, six of us at Rangers boys. I said, get the boys together. We're having a beer in the room in, in Toronto, it was. And I said, listen, you know, I'm going to speak to Ferguson, you know. He says, we'll get him up in the room. So we get Duncan into the room, you know, because there's rumours that he was coming. So Ferguson comes in. I, 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 there you go. And he was Gallus. He was a Gallus boy, you know, a real Gallus boy. So he takes his top off for some reason. You know, and he's shown us you know, the muscles and that. And for McCoy said, Coffee, he's showing the press ups, get the press ups, let's have a bet. And he says, Well, I'll do you. I said, How much? He says, 200 pounds, you know, 200 pounds. Now, you couldn't afford 200 pounds of that day, right? Fair play. Fair play. You know, <coughs> I'm down. I'm, you're, I'm, on t- you're, f- you're loaded. You're not bothered about 200 pounds. I'm, 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 I'm down doing my press ups. I think I knocked out 82 press ups at that time. 
And Ferguson, I'll never forget, he was lying on the couch, on the on the bed with a cigar. <laughs> and, a wee pen. and he went in his pocket and he said, two and a pound. He said, that's too much. That's too good for me, Goffey. <laughs> the boys went mental. Because I've got a red face. I'm fucking like that. <laughs> you just went, I'm not even, you never even tried it. <laughs> just, I love that. Good. Oh, brilliant. So we loved him, you know? We loved him. Character. I was a character. Uh, yeah. He was a great character. And I just... I fell for him when he came and Mark Haightley had a couple of seasons that were unbelievable around about that time and um, you know when he head butted the boy and then he, all of a sudden he was going to jail you know yeah. and I was you know I'd spoke to the chairman and said you know well, this must be something you can, yeah, can do to because I had his father on the phone to me and saying there must be some you know um, and I was sad I, I was sad to see him go because mm-hmm. he would have been a great he would have been a great um, player for for our club. Yeah. Okay, uh, just on your final, uh, your first season, sorry Richard, uh, mm. obviously you lost like the Celtic. How was that feeling, defeat at a team like Rangers? Did, did Sunez say this could not happen again? <sighs> um, there was a lot of changes so the boys knew. I mean, we lost uh, at the end of the season that year to Aberdeen and he had an argument with Graham Roberts or, and that was something he never did with Sunez. You know, he didn't argue or answer him back in the dressing room. Um, it was his law, you know, that went and um, so we knew we knew um, uh, <clears throat> yeah we'd, we'd, but we knew we had a good team mm. and he got Gary Stevens the next season he got Trevor you know the season after that and then we started building properly and that was a you know that was a as strong as Rangers team as I've played in 88-89 you know, it was a really strong team you know um, yeah so it was, it was disappointing but um <clears throat> We knew, we never thought we'd go on to what, what happened, but mm. we knew we, we had a good, we had, a, we had the best players. Yeah. Was that we also David Murray been. taking over as well? Would that have a big part to play? David Murray took over in November of um, uh, 1988, that season. Yeah, and that had a big part mm. because then there was, uh, you know, there was, um, we we're just getting the pie with the best players. Mm. And like I said, <clears> the English teams were out of Europe at that time. So Rangers at that time, Rangers at that time were, for me, the top in the top three in British football, you know, uh, at that time. See, when you mentioned the big players, would soon no matter how big the player was, you would was everyone treated the same? Yeah, pretty so much. You would go through all the big players as well, huh? Yeah. yeah, yeah, you would. None of them, um, none of them would ever answer him back. Obviously, he's a great number, but no, no, none wow. of them would ever. You know, you knew, but but he just knew he was a, he was a football man, so. You know, it's saying to myself and Butcher, who was, I was captain of Scotland, Butcher captain of England, you know, you can never get that now. No. Uh, I would come in if me and Butcher were not playing too well, which wasn't very often, but if we weren't, he would come in and say, listen, I'm, I'm not going to tell you how to head the ball out of the box, you know, and, and where to hold your line and blah, 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 you know. Um, you know, sometimes myself and Butcher would have an argument in the dressing room. And that's what I always say about Ray Wilkins. He could he was the only one who could come up and say, Hey, 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 you're both better than that, you know, and separate, you know. And that's why I love Ray Wilkins so much. Mm. I mean, but if you think all the experience we had there, Ray Wilkins, eighty caps for England, Butcher, eighty caps. Wow. I mean it was Gary Stevens, right, you know, that was just tremendous players. Yeah. And it, you you know yourself, Simon, if you play with better players, Makes you better. Makes you better as yeah. well. Uh, did did you did David Murray interact much with the players? Did you have many dealings with him? Um, I did. I did after you know after I became captain. I did uh, uh, you know a lot of uh, interaction with David. Well, I say a lot. Um, I learnt a lot from Ray Clements. You know, as a captain of a, you know how to captain a football team and Terry and Terry Butcher. Yeah. Terry was a different captain to myself, where he was very very. Um, very vocal. I wasn't maybe. I just try to lead by example and um, wouldn't ask anyone to do anything that I wouldn't do type thing, you know. Mm. And, um, but um, I used to go through David Murray and um, do the bonuses and do you know before before the start of the season and stuff like that, you know, and just make sure everything was everything was in black and white. We knew what was happening. Did you quite like that side of things? Yeah, because David Murray was great. I used to say, we want that. And he would say, yeah, that's fine. So you're after, aren't 
Now we've got back the players, and the players are like, oh, well, you should have asked for more. <laughs> <laughs> Christy, he was very much, you should have asked for more. I should take over there. I should take over there. Imagine having yeah. jabbed that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Go to Christy's charity. Yeah. <laughs> he's not being a fiver, he's being a fortune. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, but see, when David exactly. Murray came in, obviously, soon as is there, was the aim to be elite, not just in Scotland, but also Europe? Um, is that spoken about amongst the players and the, the staff? No, not really. Yeah. Not really. Um, we just... We just enjoyed our football, Simon, you know, and uh, a good team. In the European thing, it was different then. Uh, it was knockout. So mm. we drew we drew some really good teams. And when we had that good team, I mean, we drew, we drew Bayern Munich, got knocked out, you know. Drew Red Star Belgrade, who went on to win it as well. And they were a fantastic team as well in 1981. Then the rules changed again. Um, when you could only have so many foreigners in the team, you know, yeah. they kind of did that. And at that period, say maybe 93, 94 to, to 96, we never had enough good Scottish players, I always thought, to to have a real issue, to compete mm. at the highest level, you know. Yeah. Uh, right, the signing that sent Shockwaves to Scottish football, Mo Johnson. Ray Morris. Did Graham speak to you before that about signing him or was it a complete yeah. shot? He did, yeah? Yeah. Did he ask your opinion? Yeah. Um... Well, not ask my opinion, it just you know, it was and I was like, oh. well, I, I kind of had a sense of it because I'd played with Morrison uh, before the, we played England in the May, you know, in the Rouse Cup, we used to play against England and, uh, um, you know, Morris said, I'll see you at pre-season, Goffey. And I was like, what? He said, I'll see you at pre-season. And I went away, I went away down to South Africa, I was, you know, I'd come back. And then when I got to, when I came back in, um, Graham said he'd, he'd signed him, you know, and he's coming in in a helicopter that day. He says, uh, alert the boys. I'm like, I just shook my head, you know, I said, great player at that time. So were you happy with it? Delighted. Yeah. Delighted. Was he magnificent? Uh -huh. Aye, he was. Uh -huh. He was as good as, as well. he was during that period when we was at Nantes, he was as good as centre forward, Scottish centre forward that I played with. Um, wow. He was, um, he was tough. Lemon stone dripping wet. He was great touch, brave as a lion. Um, and that first six months he was at Rangers, he was fantastic as well. Mm -hmm. He was on the move all the time. I don't know if it was maybe he's thinking a sniper would get him or something, but it was like he was moving all the time. He was he was great, you know. And I think he played with a lot with Mark Haitley up front as well at that first season. But good in the dressing room. How was the dressing room with him? Was there, was there, Play, a, lot, was there a lot of wind-ups? Uh, yeah, there was a lot of wind-ups. Who would, you know, who, who would be come. the one that would wind them up, McCoyst? Yeah, we did, Andy. We had such a good... Uh, I was so fortunate, um, you know, like, you know, as a captain of that team because we had such a good dressing room. There was a lot of um, influential people in it, you know, but we all got on very well together, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I always say, you know, there wasn't many bad apples in the dressing room. <clears throat> You know, and if if there if there ever was a bad apple, it would get rid of them. Yes, yes. Would you do that as captain, or would that be the manager that would do it? No, it'd be the manager. But you know, you could you could often see you know. But like I said, we had a great dressing room. There wasn't most people came in and loved it. There wasn't many that um, that came and were a bad apple type thing. And there wasn't many bad apples during that period of time. Yeah, the best one that you mentioned, Ray Wilkins. How good a teammate and guy was he? And player as well. And I was, I was so sad to see, you know, to see him die young. Um, he was brilliant as well. You know, I used, I lived in Bodwell at that time, and he bought a house right next door to me, and um, we used to come into training together. And I just, I just used to like feed on, you know, his stories about AC Milan, and, you know, and Paris Saint Germain, and you know, I used to love it. And he used to get there during the early nineties. Or eight, he was, he was yeah, from 88. Yeah, he, he signed not long after me. I think maybe, yeah, not long after me. So right. he was here, yeah. So he had the, he was piping in AC Milan, you know, the, um, the games from Serie A, Serie A. So I used to go to his house on a Sunday and watch AC Milan play. And I, I just used to watch Baresi and how he handled his, his back four and, you know, Maldini was a young player coming through and just the line they took and how far up the field they were and, you know, it was great, you know. So I learnt, I learnt a lot 
from watching that Milan team play and, and listening to Ray Wilkins Brilliant. talking about football. What a guy. Uh, Top man. As you say, you took over the great player. Yeah, was he a great player? Uh-huh. Yeah. Even at that age, still tremendous. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, you took over the captaincy from Terry Butcher. Uh, how much did you learn for him as well? A lot. Terry was good. Best centre back I've played with. Is he? Yeah. By a mile. And what, just com- competitive, aggressive? Competitive, aggressive. The year I played with him in 88, 89, he was probably one of the best centre backs in the world. Was he, huh? Yeah, he was um, uh, great left foot, great passer. So he could play, could he, huh? He could play. Very good, very good, you know. Um, and Would I you just argue quite good. a lot, John Gibbs? No. No. Nah. Oh, he would just say, is it my turn for, is it my turn to hurt the centre forward, Richard? This week was uh, your turn. So I think it's your turn again, Terry. Centre forward crapping himself, you know. I mean, it's not. Would he give centre forward was a bit verbal as well? Yeah, he was a bit more in the head. Yeah, he was in the head a wee bit, you know. Hoddle was like that as well, funny enough, talking to other players, which surprised me. And was he? What, yeah, wind him up like? Yeah, yeah. I remember him playing against Finney Jones once. And he said, you're a bricklayer, son, aren't you? <laughs> and he went, I've got this wall that I need to to get you know done in uh, in my massive garden. <laughs> and you oh, come round, stuff. you know. Big time. And, and I'm thinking, the Finney Jones was going to take his head off, you know. And he would. He would just love it. Was Hoddle tough? Off. Like, could Hoddle hand oh, on himself? Yeah, he would just put his through legs. his legs and stuff like that. You know, it was amazing. Right. Uh, just on the captaincy, can yeah, you yeah. remember the moment you were asked? Yeah, people always say to me, what's your, your best moments in a, in a Rangers jersey, you know? And I went, oh, for, for Rangers. And I said, well, I said that my two best moments or my three best moments weren't in a jersey, a Rangers jersey. One when I signed. Um... The second one when I was made captain of Rangers Football Club because I knew what it meant. Um, and the third was when I picked up nine in a row and I had a suit on. So those were my three best moments. When, in a jersey. Yeah. When in a jersey. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, you know, I, th- I knew that was a natural progression. I, I, it was a shame how Terry Butcher, you know, left the club um, because he was sent to Coventry, you know. You know um, he left... Uh, under a shadow, really, and it, should have, it shouldn't have been like that because mm. he was a great, you know, he he brought professionalism to the club and a winning... Um, mentality. Yeah, the mentality of the club changed, I think, when himself and Sunas came, you know, um, and, the, and, the, and the boys thrived on that, you know. So he played, I think, in the 1990 World Cup with an injury and Sunas didn't want him to play for England and he played and... You know, went on that season. Yeah. And, uh, I think in nineteen, it was, yeah, it was nineteen ninety. I think, yeah, um, we played Red Star Belgrade, got beat, then we played a League Cup final. It was my first one as a captain. And Terry, for some reason, no one will know what happened between him and Graham that day, but he was asked to play and he never played or whatever. And um, that was him. That was him off. And um, Graham asked me to be. You know, the captain. Did he pull you in the office? Yeah. Did yeah. you know it was coming? Yeah, I knew mm. it was coming, yeah. I knew it was coming, you know. And Did you get emotional about stuff like that? Or? Um, uh, yeah, I, I did, because I thought <clears throat> it was something as well that, you know, I just think the Rangers captain, or the Celtic captain, they're institutions, both clubs are institutions in the city, and it means, it means a lot to, to everyone. You know, to 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 captain the club, mm. you know. So, yeah, it was a big, it was a big honour. And I've, I've captained Tottenham, I've captained Everton, I've captained big clubs. Yeah. So, but Rangers is. Um, was your dad a Rangers fan growing up? Sorry? Yes. So, do you remember making the phone call to tell him? Yeah, he was happier than me. You know, uh, not happier than me, but I mean, you know, very proud. Yeah. And my grandfather's a Rangers supporter as well, so he's from he was from Deniston, so it was good. Did you have like a committee or that, or was it just you? No, just you. It's not committee. Mm. It's not committee. I mean, I got a call from David Murray when when I heard actually one of my English uh, friends in the press called me and said um, uh, uh, Graham Sunis is leaving the club at the end of the season, and I went, "What? I couldn't believe it." You know, he said, "Yeah, he's going to sign for Liverpool," and I got a call not long after that, but like ten minutes after, from David Murray and said, "Come into the club tomorrow morning early." 
So I went in and he said, um, I just want your opinion on Walter Smith. Is, would Walter Smith be the, is okay for the next match? I said, absolutely. You know? so I said, why? What's, he said, well, Graham's leaving right away. So, you know, David Murray took a, a big chance because Graham wanted to leave at the end of the season. But he said to Graham, if you're leaving, you know, now, then you leave right now type thing, you know. Mm. So, yeah, so wee things like that, you know, just to make, you know, I had a close relationship with David Murray too. So you've gave Walter Smith his career. Well done, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's yeah, just say but no, I, mean, just, I mean, he just wanted to make, you know, <clears throat> make sure, you know, would be fine with the yeah. boys. And I just said, absolutely. I mean, I said, Walter. And what was it Walter about Walter that you thought he would be fine? <sighs> no, Everyone that comes on here says that Walter was scarier than Graham Sooner. Yeah, if you go on the wrong side of him. And, uh, yeah, Walter's the two completely different people. Um, and then when they were together, it was very good because Walter's man management skills were, you know, top class. And what will it? Top class. What would he do that was so good? Well, he would just know how to treat people better. Graham would must probably treat everyone the same. Yeah. Now, you can't treat everyone the same, Simon, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, we've worked better we've worked out as we, we get older, you know? Um, Walter was, he would treat Brian Loudrup differently to me. You know, he knew why, he knew, he knew what rocked my boat, but he couldn't do that with, with Loudrup or something, or, mm. or a Gascoigne, you know, all, all the different players that we kind of had. And the players that we had over the, you know, Gorans and different people over at McCoists, he brought the best out in McCoist, who as soon as maybe didn't bring the best out in McCoist. Mm. You know, so he just knew, he knew the buttons to press, Walter. Um, I love Sunus. I love Sunus as a manager. I like that type of management. Just boom, straight down the line, you know. Um, and I loved Walter Smith as well. You know, worked with Walter for twenty four out of twenty five years. Yeah, you know, it was uh, it was great. And and he he took over a really difficult time. Um, I can remember I got sick through the last two games of the season. Uh, I was in Ross Hall, I, I wasn't well, and um, it was a crucial game against Aberdeen that we had to, to win, and, and Haitley scored twice, you know? And that was three games into Walter's... Taking over. ...into career. But it was some some call by David Murray to say to, to Graham... When you go. If, you're not, if you don't want to be here, you go now. Mm. I mean, three games to go, you know what I mean? You know, it was a big... It was a big call. Did you have a conversation with Sunis before he left? No. No. I spoke to him after since and you know he, I think he admits that it was the biggest mistake of his life, you know. To leave, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh, right, just out of Scotland, how much yes. did you take pride playing for the national team three major tournaments, Mexico eighty six, Italia <coughs> ninety, Euro ninety two. Did you I always do you always see yourself as Scottish? Or? Yeah, always saw myself. Always, always saw myself. You know, growing up in South Africa, my dad was a professional football player, played for a team out there. There was a lot of um, expats come out to play um, out there at that time. Um, so I, I knew Bobby Hume, Craig Watson, who had played for Rangers, they came out to, to play. So I grew up listening to Rangers stories. You know, I grew up uh, wanting to be a football player. Um, you know, so it just worked out that way for me. So it was. You used to go to school fine. in South Africa by Kilton? <laughs> no, but it was a very Scottish upbringing I got, you know, even though, I mean, <laughs> my mum always slaughters me when I went to, to Sweden in 92. Uh, I was well known in Sweden that I was born in Stockholm. Yeah, what a place. Um, great place. Mm -hmm. And um, so the Swedish TV wanted to interview me. So I said, yeah, fine, captain of Scotland, but born in Sweden, you know. So they interviewed me and the guy started talking Swedish to me, you know. And I was like, I'm sorry, you know, my mum, my mum could have taught me Swedish. I killed my mum for that. And I said on Sweden national TV, my mother never taught me Swedish and she got pounded, you know, by all her cousins. But it was my dad. So I'm, you don't know, need that, Swedish. Like, that stupid language, you know. But you know, my dad would have, I've always said, my dad would have shot me if I'd played for, for Sweden. Brilliant. But that was McLean as well. McLean obviously said to Jock Steen and McLean was assistant to Jock Steen at that time. <clears throat> Said he must have must have had a good player here. Yeah, you better get him. By the way, but he's born in Sweden. But his oh, dad's so Scottish. Clinton got you to play for Scotland, is it? Huh? I'm sure. But he got uh, he got Jock Steen. Okay. 
yeah, just to say he better get him tied up yeah. for the under 21, you know, just, just in case he makes it, you know what <laughs> I mean? So, yeah, so that happened. So once I played for the under 21s, then. That was you. Yeah, but I would never, I was always, my, um, my goal was to, to play for Scotland one day and it happened, you know. And the uh, proudest moment, the captain in Scotland, you're on it, you're saying your birthplace in Sweden. Yeah, I mean, Sorry, a great, great, like I said, I mean, I, I made my debut March of 30th, 1983. Uh, Charlie Nicholas scored two goals um, against um, against Switzerland. Um, they had a big centre forward, and that was Alan Hansen, I think, and Willie Miller, and big Jock Steen was, you know, that's what I liked about about him, he gave. He never said anything to me. He said he threw the number two shirt at me. He said, "Listen, play. Do do for your country what you do for your club. Go play." That was it. Right. That was a team talk. Mm. I was like, that. "Wow, this is brilliant." I just ran up and down, you know. <laughs> and um, you know, Jockstein, he, he took Alan Hansen off for half time. The big centre forward was giving him a hard time, and he. He slaughtered Hansen in the dressing room. I was like, oh, I was like, oh my God, you know, what's uh-huh. happening? Yeah, he slaughtered Hansen and he, and he threw, he just threw the shirt at the cleach and he says, go take care of the big centre forward and Big Alec came on. But I was like, you know, the power, you know, I mean, Hansen was a great, Mother Pool, great, uh-huh. great player, you know, 83, you know, right at the peak. And he was getting knocked about and Jock wasn't having it, you know. Just took him off. Just took him off, half time. Put, put, put Alec in and Alec put the nut on the boy you know, and, <laughs> and was that the start of Alec McLeish's international career after <laughs> no, that? Alec had been playing uh-huh. you know a wee bit but, but that was that was 83 so so I played for Scotland 61 caps I was very proud of the 61 caps um, I'd had a few issues with the Scotland career my end of career it was, it was a regret of mine um, we handled it wrongly because um, I should have had 125 caps mm. not 61 because I went on to play from 93 to 2001. Um, and, um, you know, during that period, I know it extended my, my Rangers career and maybe may my thing, but I still think was probably I was up there as Scotland's most probably best centre back during that period from, from, from 93, 94 to when I finished playing, you know. Mm. And what was it? Was it issues with the coaches? Yeah, it was a few issues we had, but it was was handled wrongly. And I I, I, I stupidly did a book where I criticised um, Andy Roxburgh and Craig Brown, and I shouldn't have. Um, I should have just told, you know, girded my huff, as they say. Yeah. And I didn't. I was stubborn, and um, I think also they handled it the wrong way as well. Um, you know, because you need you want your best players to be playing for you. You know, so, and it never happened, so. Have you spoken to him since? Mr. Roxborough? Yeah. Yeah. Brown, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and Craig Brown, yeah. Yeah. That's all right? Yeah. That's all good. Okay. Uh, Champions League. Rangers being so dominant in Scotland, was there a set aim to win the Champions League? Did you feel that was possible? Um, you know, Walter was massive on Europe, wasn't he? Yeah, he was, but but during that period as well, when especially when we got to... to Six in a row, seven, like, you know, and then he started getting closer to the the ninth. That was more the aim. Yeah, that was more not not the aim. We wanted to do well in both, and there was no rotation system. You know, like I, I, I was thinking the other day, I was, I was looking at Joe Aribo. I'm just mentioning this out of you know, instant, yeah. he, he split his head open, got twenty stitches. You know, I said that happened to me on quite a few occasions. Every game, huh? <laughs> Most games, yeah. but not. <laughs> you should try and hit it at the centre back, you know, the centre forward. But but it would happen sometimes, and you know, I, and I'm sure sure I was concussed, and then play. So you would play the, the next Saturday, you know, you would get stitched up, and you would play the next Saturday with a band on you, you know, on the head, and you would just go play, and um, now you can't play for three weeks, mm. you know. So um, we we never had a good enough squad for Walter Smith to go, listen, by the way, we're playing Juventus on the, on the, on the sat, on the, on the Wednesday night. Uh, can we, um, we'll rotate you, Richard, have a rest. We weren't good enough to do that, yeah. to say, because we're going for eight, nine, eight, seven, eight, nine in a row. We're saying, we need to beat Motherwell at Fair yeah. Park. We need to beat Hearts at Tynecastle. You, we need to play. So we were, we were full steam ahead, you know? So I, I think that, um, 
didn't help us in a lot of ways. Um, I think we would have done, we would have, we would have been better in Europe if we could have rested all our players, like Juventus or Ajax would do mm -hmm. in, in their league. They would, they would sometimes not play half their team because they were running away with their league. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Or they weren't too bothered. They weren't going for a like. I don't know. No, no. A historic thing that yeah. in our little small country that that was important yeah. to us. Um, further European controversy came 1993 mm -hmm. claims of Marseille. Mark Haley, did you think someone was up? Um, when he got sent off, you mean? Yeah, was or, it? No, they were. Oh, you mean Brighton and Marseille? Yeah, Brighton no, and that, yeah. yeah, I've heard that. You know, I, 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 I think that was probably right. It was probably was um, bribing the referees. But that Marseille team was the best team I was probably played against as a club team. Right. So they. They didn't need any bribes to be anyone. I don't think they knew anything about it. The team, maybe their president. Dead the right. Okay, yeah. He was maybe trying to get to referees, but mm -hmm. the team never. I mean, they had a team as Bartes, Angloma, Bolly, you know, Desai, wow. Echo, Swazi up front, Voller and Boxic, Abidi Pele. So they had the best team, you know, on paper that. You know, maybe I played against club team. See, with the European and the Scotland stuff that you've had, obviously playing against a big who was the best that you came up against centre forward with? Um, it was probably um, uh, it was probably Van Basten. Oh wow, Van Basten was a good player. Oh, I played didn't against you? yeah, I played yeah, it was a great player, and I played against Voller many. You know, I played against Voller first when we were twenty one. Both of us were twenty one, and he played for Werder Bremen against Dundee United uh, back in the day. Um, Did he have that naughty moustache at 21? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, the long hair, the <laughs> curly, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think it was, yeah. Um, but he was, he was just, he knew he was going to, he knew was going to go far and he did, yeah. you know, he was a great, um, I can remember just elbowing him one time in a, in a Scotland game and... You liked the old elbows, didn't you? Yeah, well, you try, you, you try, you know, well, you try to make, you try to put something on the centre forward, you know, I mean, it was more physical back, yeah. you know, in those days or... He wanted to make sure the, the centre forward knew he was in a game. Mm. Not he was going to get a ball and just be easy for him. Huh, yeah, you know. So, so yeah, I think I managed to catch him a good one. You know, and I knew <laughs> if you call him a good one, I call him a good one. And I'm and he and he and he caught me one bag very very quickly. You know, and he says, "Can we play football now, Mister Goff?" I says, "Absolutely, <laughs> <laughs> no problem." <laughs> Typical German, you know. Uh, hard as nails. Yeah, yeah, hard as nails. <laughs> so, oh. You know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna. Um, At bat on. Yeah, you're not gonna unnerve him in any way. You know, mm. so it was great. Also played with some great players. Gonna run through a couple. Mm. Uh, Alan McCoy, as we've mentioned a couple of times, he was there for your entire spell. How much I laugh and how good was he um, in the rest of it? He was great. He was. He's a very good friend of mine. Um, uh, he's great personality. Great in the dressing room. Last at the bar. Um, yes, <laughs> but he would say I was last in the bar. Um, but um, bubbly, and he would keep everything going. You yeah, would definitely keep every, everything going. But you know, there's a, there's a side to him as well that you know people don't see. That, you know that I saw that he was very very hugely competitive, very competitive. I mean, we used to we used to sometimes go on different sides in training, and you know, I, I always tell people, you know, I've had three or four fights at Rangers when I was when I was there and you know the bust ups and that and you know two or three of them were with him um, was that huh? yeah yeah and um, but that was because we were both very competitive but people don't see that side of him you know yeah I think it's a laugh and a joke all the time but it's yeah not, but it? he's not yeah he's not you know and I mean he was one of the few that um, could say to me as a captain he would sometimes say to me why if I wasn't having a good game or or their centre forward was doing well he'd say Goffy I'm getting booted here Sort him out now, you know. He would say to Did me, "Did he have that in him? I had to do that yeah, to you, right? yeah, but from forty yards away. Yeah. So the centre forward would then go to me. I'm getting booted on it. <laughs> I said, "But my centre forward tells me to boot you. You're getting booted, you know. Like, like, you yeah, know, like, yeah. like just it was, it was just a laugh, but but in all seriousness, you know. Yeah, you know. So yeah, we would. Um, it was quite funny because, well, you know, like I said, the senior players run the dressing room, so we had really good senior players at the club at the time. And if we were losing sometimes, you know, Walter would give us a couple of minutes just as a players, you know. Soft, isn't it? Sometimes just give us, you know, just wee heads up, just give, give us a minute, a couple of minutes with the players and um, we, would, we would try and sort it out ourselves. Would Koist ever be cheeky with Walter? 
Um, yeah, many times, many times. But but Walter, but like I say, Walter knew how to handle them. You know, I, I mean, Chrissy would come. You know, he said, talk about stories with people. I can't tell most of them because they're, they're unrepeatable <laughs> on, on, on this show. But one, he would he would always be late, Alistair. So we would be leaving for Pataudry maybe, you know, like one o'clock. You know, like on a Friday afternoon or yeah. something, we'd go up and he would go there. Uh, the bus would be outside, one o'clock, Christy, you know, on the bus, you know, and he would walk on at five past one. And everyone's waiting there for Christy. And he would come onto the bus and Walter would go, come on, man, you know. And he would, Christy would look down the bus and he went, Walter, have a look down the back of the bus. Who's going to get you the winner at the Toddy tomorrow? <laughs> None of those pricks. <laughs> I'll get you the winner. Though. <laughs> this bus leaves when I say so. Great. Ah, brilliant. That was brilliant, you know. I would laugh at that. Huh? I would laugh at it, but you couldn't do but anything else but laugh, you know. And the boys, yeah, you know, so. And most of the time, you did get the winner. You know, that, that was a problem, yeah. you know. See, good. in Tuna, when you were playing against, against each other in Tuna, would he, would he get in your ear at Tuna as well? Yeah, he would try. I, I, maybe he used to like playing against me in training because he used to say, Dundee United, I used to score against Dundee United all the time, right? <laughs> and I went, Christy, you played against Hegarty and Mary. I said, I was playing right back. I was scoring against you the other side. I said, you weren't chasing me back there, were you? Right. I said, I never played centre back against you, son. You know? That's why he scored that. Yeah. Uh, how vital was his goal still? Look, people always say, ah, oh, it's Derek Ferguson says he needed three, five, five chances to score. Ray Wilkins said three. He said he might have struggled to play in that way, you know, because he needed three to score, you know. I says, but look, I said, the one thing about him, he had a tremendous um, a, a confidence in his own ability. You know, if he missed chances, I've seen players miss chances and, you know, lose themselves, you know. But Koist, but Koist was, um, you know, uh, very confident in his own ability. And a lot of people said to me, oh, he wouldn't have scored so many goals in England or whatever. He might not have scored 355, but he would have scored 300, you know. Mm. I mean, he's, he was a goal scorer. Yeah. He, was, he was a goal scorer. And we played these legends games. And I mean, he played, he scored one against AC Milan. I can remember watching it, you know, and George Elbers, I was playing, obviously. George Elbers hit a cross and, and he's going, f- just just going front. This is when he's 45. Still going, going front in, in front of uh, Costa Kerr and he's, he's hit his head and it's went right into the top corner and you think, you know, that's not what. It's an instinct. Yeah, it's an instinct. Very okay. good instinct to score. Another one, uh, Andy Gorham, your goalie for the time. How Great. did you see it playing front? Brilliant. Very good. Um, Money. Eh? Money. Um, competitive. Mm. Yeah, compete. I was one of the. F- we had a, a kind of thing at Rangers. We trained how we played, so was very competitive in the training. A lot of people came to the club and they didn't really get this. You know, like Walter would be the ref, Archie Knox would be the ref, but there wasn't a ref. No free kicks. No free kicks. Just, we just booted <laughs> each, each other. other yeah. yeah, and it was, the games, the, the training games were worse than the actual game on a Saturday. So it was like, it was carnage sometimes at our training, you know, it was like, you know, it was not out to hurt people, but, but aggressive training, you know, and quick training. And Archie Knox would say, you know, give us give us twenty minutes, good stuff, and then you can just go in, you know. But twenty it, minutes, that's it. I think it's well, twenty minutes because we were training. We were, it was recovery. Playing all the time. We were playing all the time. We were playing all the yeah. time. It was playing. It was recovery, you know. Um, so, Gorham was one of those that used to um, really enjoy the training and um, try and train like he played as well, you know. So he was good. He struggled when he first came to the club, you know. He, made a few mistakes and we had a game at Parkhead it was absolutely brilliant and I used to play a high line at that time as well so made a mistake a few times and people were just threw on him one on one and he got this reputation that he was really good at that you know he would he would stand up when the people were through on against him nine times out of ten they wouldn't score you know because mm. he had this reputation they would end up just chipping the ball into him, into him you know it became you know like but if you were through on him one on one, it was very difficult to beat. Yeah, and he was, you know, he was, and um, he had some saves that uh, I can remember when he first came to the club. He was started to come for a few crosses. I said, Andy, because he wasn't the biggest goalkeeper. Yeah. I said, I'll keep the boys out. You know, like Clements had told me, you know, edge of the box. I said, if ever anyone beats you from a header from outside the box, <laughs> we're done. We're in trouble, right? So. And then we had boys who could head away, myself, David McPherson, John Brown, you know, like we, we, we were decent in the air. So 
but he had some tremendous saves, you know, and um, Mark can remember going to park in many a time and saying, we're not getting beat here. He says, no choice, you know. Because they got him? No, but we used to say to each other before we went out, you know, um, that we weren't going to get beat there. And um, a lot of the time he had some marvellous saves there at Parkhead. That, uh, but we, we, we enjoyed playing there. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. was he like as a guy? Is he quite serious, Andy Gordon? Or is he a laugh? No, great laugh. Is he? Great laugh in the dressing room. Well, if you ask Nigel Spackman, he wouldn't be a great laugh. He kind of flattened him one day. We played Aberdeen and um, Roy Aiken, of all people, scored with a volley. Then it hit Gorham on the shoulder and went in. It must have been 95, I think. <clears throat> and Andy and I used to walk off the park at half time together. And I saw him jogging. And Andy never jogged, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, oh, something's up here, you know. And Spackman had given up the, the hands, you know, like in front of 40, 50,000 people at Ibrox, you know, because it hit Gorham on the yeah. shoulder and went in. And Gorham just came around the corner and just <laughs> pounded him. Well, I mean, that. Spackman was quite clever because he just stayed down. He never tried to fight back, you know. And actually, Andy just got tired of hitting him. And <laughs> Walter Smith was standing right there. Just a limit. Yeah. 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 Brilliant. Right. Never, uh, never, never point at me again, you know, one of those <laughs> ones. And I need to ask you, Gaza, did he like the place up when he came? Um, yeah. Yeah. Because um, I, was in, I was in South Africa. I got a phone call from Gary Mabbitt, who's a, a godfather of my uh, second child. Oh, and, is he? Uh, yeah. Right. And, um, Great boy, man, but you know, so he says, oh, by the way, you found, you've signed Gascoigne. I says, really? I said, all right. He says, is it, and he was the captain of Tottenham at the time, obviously, and this is 95, 94, 95, 95 it was. He says, oh, it's a disaster in the dressing room, coffee, you know. He says, you won't be able to handle him, you know. I says, no, I said, this is a big dressing room up here. We've got some big hitters up here. You won't be mucking around up here. What does he do? He says, well, he just cuts up your suit or your clothes and, you know, he did a jobby and the, <laughs> the, the Tottenham has changed him. I says, yeah, he did. <laughs> Someone's shoe or something. I says, <laughs> you know, so he came in. I, I come I come the first day back of training. I'm in early. He's already there. He's sitting with the Jimmy Five Bellies in the dressing room. I says, wait, do you? Five Bellies. Out, you know. Sweet so Jimmy was sitting in the dressing room. We've been wee Jimmy Fatch at it. <laughs> so that, and Gascon says, Oh, I'm so looking forward to play with you, Gothy, and blah, blah, blah. You know, and you, you know, I've heard so much, you know, you know. I says, Look, Jimmy Ballard put him right next to me. I says, You touch my clothes. I said, I'm knocking you out, right? And he looked me up and down. He says, All right. He says, I only cut up Armani and Versace. I don't do Marks and Spencer. <laughs> <laughs> he's, done like, he's done me nice with you, like, <laughs> So it was brilliant, you know. But um, first game, I got the ball from Gorham and he had a couple of people around about him. And I've given it to the right back or something. He went, Goffey, give me the ball, man. I says, there's two people right behind you. I don't, you know, give me the ball. So I fired the next one into him. Boom. And it's just like, He's, he's giving it like that, th- you know, through his legs to the centre forward. It, uh, no, not to the centre forward. Oh, he just touched it like that. Through the centre forward. Yeah, 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 yeah. I went, oh my God, you know. It's a bit like Oddle, a bit different, you know. Yeah. Glenda was more balanced. Gascoigne was, get it in any situation. You know, pass it into him and spin it around and go that way. And, you know, he just, he was a Off genius. Off the cuff. Off yeah. the cuff. He was a genius. But, Genius and madness sometimes is close together, you know? Yeah. And then he got sent off three or four times on our European journeys. And, you know, he said to me, he reminded me the other day, he said, remember, remember Amsterdam? Because I'd just seen him three or four days ago. He said, remember, and he's got one of these photographic memories, you know, like he remembers right. everything. Every little detail. Uh-huh. Every little detail. So, he said, you remember Amsterdam when I got sent off? I said, yeah, after 14 minutes, he got sent off the other day, you know. Wow. We got beat 4 0. We needed like 14 players against them, not <laughs> like 10. And I came into the dressing room and I was looking for him. He wasn't in the dressing room. So I went into the toilets and there was one cubicle shut and I just volleyed it down. I booted it down. 
and he was he was crying on the toilet, you know. And uh, I couldn't say anything to him. He was, he was, he was crying, and something had happened the previous weekend that wasn't right, you know. And the, but um, great player, great player. Would Walter never go mad at Gascoigne, or mm-hmm. could you not go mad at him? Would Walter still? Or would you just leave him? Um, that's why I say Walter's man management was good, you know. And how to deal with players like him? It was good, you know. I mean, I remember Walter saying to me one time that. Um, Gascoigne had found out that Gascoigne had been out at three in the morning or something in Glasgow or somewhere, you know, somewhere. He says, I'm not going to play him today, Goffey, you know. He says, uh, maybe tell him, you know. I'm not going to play him, you know. So I went to tell him and he started burst out in tears, you know, before the game. Um, so I don't think he played that day. I can't remember, but, you know, it was just unusual. Yeah. And you had to treat him. Fascinating. Yeah, it was fascinating. The fascinating, uh, fascinating boy, fascinating player, you know. We had the McCoy's funny again. Yeah, great, brilliant. Were they best of pals, huh? I don't know if they're best of pals, but but um, but they were good. He used to pitch up McCoy to his house, you know. But <laughs> but Coisty gave him a key. key. Why would you give him a key? I mean, what did you give him a key for? <laughs> did he tell you a story with the fireworks or something? Ah, uh, he brought the fireworks. Yeah. I had firing them right over his house, you know, and holding them in a milk bottle like that. <laughs> I mean, take your arm off, you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, it's horrendous, eh? What, oh, addressing that. him to? No, no, it was, that, there, wasn't a, there wasn't a quiet moment, you know? And that, that, that's the days when you used to train Ibrox. Well, we used to go to Ibrox and then we get a minibus, yeah. you know, to, um, to wherever. We used to, tra- we used to train on a cricket ground, you know? Did you say Yeah, that? Like, you know, up in the West End. Yeah, so, you, you know. One of the best teams we were away up there. We never had a training centre. Yeah, uh, of course, I had that when they'd been built back then. Yeah, but it was good. It was actually good for the camaraderie and stuff like that. Oh, uh, going up on a mini bus. And... Getting a laugh on the bus. Oh, uh, it was funny, you know. What about the social funny. side? You being captain, would you organise days out? Because I think yeah. people have said on here it was no, a bit no, of a drinking no, culture. No, it was, but you know, if we're drunk as much as we were supposed to, Simon, we wouldn't have won yeah. 18 trophies during the time I was there. Um, I I would organise mainly when we lost. When yeah, we won, it was mm-hmm. fine. But when we lost again, because that's when all the shit hits the fan normally. You know, you know he starts doing this and there's falling out here. So when we lost a game, I'd say to Walter, taking the boys for a blowout. You know, he went okay. Uh, take them, take them Monday. I'll give you Tuesday off. We'll see you on Wednesday, Thursday, something. So it was all organised. You know, mm-hmm. so. Just you got a favourite one? Don't want you. <laughs> favourite dirt? Don't want you in the don't want you in the papers, you know? Favourite what? Do you have you got a favourite dirt? Um there were some classics. There were some classics up at we used to go up to St Andrews every now and again for a bit, a bit of R and R. And the wee kit man, uh wee George, who was, was our wee kit man, had a, like a ten thousand pound bill for all the drink that was Just put it on his room. <laughs> put it on his room. <laughs> What's <laughs> <laughs> the cup to me? He had some. That's a bit of those expensive whiskeys he was drinking, you know. Pretty good, you know. But it was good, you know. I mean, and we would we'd go out and it would just we would we were good together and um, we had some good times, you know. We had some good times, uh, and that's why a lot of us are still good friends today, Simon. You know, you yeah. you, you pick up. We can pick up where we left off, you know. And we had a good dress and like you said, variety. But always had boys who, were, you know, who um, could lift it when when it was down. What was your auntie one-liners? Uh, your aunt's one-liners? Yeah, yeah, it was good. You know, it was just typical Glasgow boys, you know, yeah. just just funny boys. You How know? did foreign boys and stuff like that take? Did... Difficult, you know. A lot of them couldn't handle it, you know. Yeah. I mean, I can remember real good players coming over to us and you know not really doing as well as they should have, you know, <laughs> because the boys were giving them a bit. Uh... Yeah, because you would play in training and. The, you know, like Van Vossen would, you know, I don't know, do something in training and we did it, it would be four million, paid four million for you, you half <laughs> Fucking that, you know, you know, like, and it used to affect them, but I used to say, we man, can't do that. Just give, give a break, you know. <laughs> just you know, be on all the time. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, so if you, you had to be hard skinned yeah. you know, to, to come into the dressing room, it was a tough dressing room. Right, going different. for nine in a row. Mm. In the final push, how much that lift is it when you get quality players? Brian Loudrop and George Alberts walk in the door. 
Yeah, Elvis came in the last season. He's like, six, eight, seven. Yeah. When you're going for nine, last season, going for nine. Yeah. Away, yeah. And he took to it right away. Big German, you know. Tank, wasn't he? Oh, it was great. I mean, he played in. It was my testimonial. August, um, early August, we played Arsenal, and um, I always remember it. And uh, we're three 0 up against Arsenal, and he had scored, and they had Dixon and Bold and Winterburn, Keel yeah. and Winterburn, right? And uh, lad had started mucking around and standing on the ball and that and Dixon just walked right by him and says Richard get him off otherwise we're gonna they're gonna snap him in two so I said to Walter you have to take Ladrup off and Ladrup's like I think I'm doing well <laughs> I said yeah they're gonna, gonna break your leg by the way these boys they were two weeks behind us in pre-season you know yeah but Elvin scored that day and I thought aye aye just give it to him on his left foot he'll he'll do all right spank you know? it oh um yeah, it was good. Good team. Good like the fans team. were our best, didn't it? Yeah, and our team was different then uh, to it was, like I said earlier. Um, we 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 changed the three at the back. I played three at the back uh, with the with with two fullbacks. You know that I could make a five yeah. because Gascoigne and Louder. You know, because I used to say to Gascoigne as well, don't don't. I don't want you tackling anyone. Just I try to do that huddle the thing huddle with him. Yeah, yeah. Just you, just you hide away, and I, so as soon as we get it. We'll feed it to you. So Ladrup used to be good like that, you know, but Gascoigne wanted to, Gascoigne used to say to me, oh, and that was, that's what made him loved in the dress room. Gascoigne used to go, no, I want to tackle people like McCall and Ferguson and you. I want to hurt people. I said, Gascoigne, 91 final, you hurt yourself. You can't tackle. tackle. Don't tackle anyone, right? You know, he went, no, I'm going to, I want to kick people in that, you know? You know? Oh, boy. He was funny, you know, uh-huh. it was great. Uh, you scored in a 2 one over Celtic in the 9 in a row season. How much did you love the games? Yeah, Celtic games are great games, you know. Um, I used to enjoy playing there. Um, look, you know, uh, big games, I used, to, I used to start to think I used to play better in them. Um, and, you know, you know, I, I used to sometimes get, you know, mate, after I stopped playing for Scotland, you know, that you used to sometimes get the crowd singing bad things about you and, you know, like stuff like vile chants. And sometimes that happened. And a Celtic punter said to me once, we never, we never, um, we never abused bad players. <laughs> we only abused the good ones, you know. That makes so you feel better. <laughs> yeah, they're, 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 I know what it was, but, you know, like I look at the stuff now coming out and racist abuse and this. I mean, I, myself, Durante, we got vile abuse as well, but, what do you do? Do you leave or do you just carry on? You know, I mean, something should have been done way back then. Yeah. You know, it's only started now to to try and change things like that, you know, like banning people and banning stuff, you know. But um, the games that I enjoyed the most were the games that I was, um, that I knew that I'd be put under pressure, like at Parquet. Mm. I used to, I used to, I used to love going to Parquet and, and saying, you know, I used to warm up with McCoy in front of the jungle when it was a jungle. And 67,000 there saying, we're not losing here, you know? And we make sure we don't lose. You know, we'll do everything in our power not to get beat, you know, for, for our support, for, for everyone, you know? So it was, um, you know, it was a good test for us. Have you seen good players being shell-shocked by them? The first one, especially? Yeah, it's quick. It's quick, you know. It's like and I, I, I tell people, you know. I always say to people when I went um, when I went to Liverpool, when I went to Everton at the end of my career, you know, a lot of it was I was thirty eight at the time, and they said you're going to play against Owen and Owen and Fowler, and they were young boys, you know. I said, look, I, I said I've played in fifty old firm derbies. I said I don't think there's anything out there that's going to surprise me, mm. you know. And there wasn't, you know. We we won one one nil at Anfield. That was my first. Uh, Merseyside derby, but it wasn't wasn't anything like the Glasgow. Um, yeah, because the build ups, you know, <clears throat> and that's what I said about being captain of Rangers. I had people coming up to me, you know, and I'm filling my car up at the petrol, and people are saying, "Make sure, you know, you know, we win next, you know, win mm-hmm. next week, you know." So I, you were part of a family. Even when I come back to the city now, I can't believe the. The recognition that I get in the city, you know, I was walking through Glasgow with my son, who's an American boy, 
and we stopped. We were, we were going through a traffic line. There was a big bus, and the guy was saluting me. The bus driver, you know, was saluting me. And my son says, "Does everyone know you?" Mm. I went, "Maybe, maybe sort of a certain era." And he said, "Oh, well, that must be." He said, "I don't think I could live with that, you know." And we went through the next street, and it was a big bus. You were getting the fingers. It was a, so, <laughs> was it was a bus driver like that, you know. And he went, "What's he doing?" I says, "Well, he supposed that thing, but he was smiling. The boy was smiling, you know. He was getting oh, the finger, you know. So it was like my son was going, "Oh, I don't think I could have lived like that, Dad. You know, everyone knowing you." And I says, "Well, from a young age, I said I didn't know any Definitely. anything else." I said, "So I think if it had happened to me at 40, I, I um, it have shocked you." It would have been a shock, but I, because right from when I was young, I said it's been, it's just been normal for me. Yeah. Normal living. Just last bit on the derby, favourite derby memory? Favourite derby memory? Um, uh, you know, the first one as a captain, I scoring in extra time against Celtic in 1990. It was my first, uh, you know, um, uh, as a captain picking up a trophy um, to score the winner against Celtic after extra time. It's like every boy who, you know, dream, you know. Um, but I, play, I scored four times against Celtic in, in my time. They're all great memories. 96-97 um, when we were going for the title, Celtic had a really strong team. Then when we were going for 10 in a row, I scored another one. And I gave the uh, famous uh, you know, I was raising the roof. Yeah. But all the Celtic punters thought it was 10 in a row. So, but it wasn't 10 in a row. I keep telling them, they still don't believe me, you know. So, um, I, I just think the, the Derby games, people always remember those games. You know, if people come up to me in the street and they're, and they're not Rangers supporters, they go, oh, I remember your goal against England in 1985. And I remember your two goals against Cyprus. That we were 2-1 down and we won 3-2 for Scotland. <clears throat> And your first goal against Celtic, and you know, ninety fourth minute or something, you know. So, ah, so many good memories, yeah. Simon, and I was very blessed to play with so many good players over my career. And um, you know, I was very fortunate. I was a fortunate boy. I, I ended up playing for the team that I loved, and um, had a had a successful career. Right, just last year, but one in nine in a row. You were injured for the title running. What was your emotions at, at Tannadice that night? Um, well, I played, I played the, the game before against Motherwell and Owen Coyle scored twice and uh, we still had a game against Hearts to play, so I never played that night just in case we didn't win. Yeah. You know, so and we had to go and win at Hearts. Um, we, we had actually wrapped the title up by beating Celtic at Parkhead and then we, I came off for 10 minutes to go. I had to hurt my calf again, but I played the Celtic game, we won it, so that was, it, that was the game up. And then we lost about three games, you know, yeah. on that on that we. That's because you weren't playing on it. Maybe there was other problems as well, but you know, we never finished it off like we should have, you know. Yeah. And um, um, the the people say to me, you had tears in your eyes when I picked up the trophy, and I did. That was my next question, huh? Because it was um, it was a relief. It wasn't because I was I was delighted. It was a relief that we had got there because. If we hadn't got there, it would have been a disaster for us as a football club. Um, getting it was just a relief, and I, I was I was actually leaving as well because I'd said in in October. So you knew you were away, did you? No, in October I'd already said to everyone I was away, you know, and I'd made that decision with the club. So the supporters knew as well. I didn't want to come to the end and go, "All oh, right, I'm, I'm off or I'm not," you know. Yeah. So no, I'd said that I was away because the, the pressure of that was. Um, was a lot that season, mm. especially that especially season. being the captain in that as well. Yeah. yeah, and I think just I'd been there all the time, right through the whole thing, you know. So I'd seen it, you know, from from the beginning. Um, and then I came back because I'm Marissa and McLaren for ten, and honestly, we should have won ten. You know, we, we should have got the ten quite easily, but with four games to go, we had two home games against Dunfermline and Kilmarnock. And we lost against Kilmarnock and drew against Dunfermline that scored in the last minute. And uh, we lost the title by a point. But so if we hadn't, you know, if we'd won one of those home games, we would have won two yeah. in a row. <clears throat> so that was a disappointment for me. But the bigger disappointment would have been 
not matching the nine. Losing nine, uh, yeah. So you just uh, quickly on Walter Smith and Archie Knox. I always ask every Rangers player that played under Walter Smith, what's mm-hmm. the worst you've seen him crack at somebody? On on Walter Smith, yeah. Um, the worst. Stuart McCall tells a story with the um, with the when he first came up his first game for us it was in '92, and we were playing Hearts, and uh, um, I was passing the ball around, and we come in at half time. We, 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 we were slow, yeah. And and um, we come in, and he and he's he's hammering me. He says, you know, he gave me a real hard time about playing old man's football, about just passing it and getting it back and passing it and getting back without going anywhere, you know, without actually trying to fire into the strikers. And Stuart McCall said that day, he said, when he can give a Rangers manager, uh, the Rangers captain, as as a bollocking like he did that day, he said, I knew, oh, this is it's a wee bit different he says, bit my yeah he says because I thought you were playing quite well <laughs> <laughs> and he said that you know that, I thought you were doing well we were doing well we were keeping the ball and we, but we weren't going anywhere yeah. you know and he'd come in and just pounded on you you know and he says you were like oh, okay and you just would you just always take it yeah, 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 yeah. what about Archie Knox because I thought he was my youth team manager at Scotland and we were shit scared of <laughs> brilliant but brilliant. a great guy isn't he but he could, he could lose it as well couldn't yeah. he yeah I mean I uh, yeah, he could lose it big time and good friend of mine as well. And when he was my assistant manager at Livingston, I'll never forget, we're playing one day and I wanted to go really all out attack, you know, and, and then he said, no, you can't do that. And and I said, well, you can't have it both ways, Archie. You know, you, I ain't a go for it. You, you know what I mean? You, you know. And then so I go in at half time and he's not there, you know. He had, um, he had disappeared. You know, and I knew because I'd upset him because I'd had a go at him about you know, you know, saying that to him. You know, so um, he said, "Are you the expert now, Goffey?" You know, <laughs> I'd only been a manager for like, like two minutes, <laughs> <laughs> and now you you know it all. You know, I said, "I'm really sorry. I apologise." So you just never came in for half time. No, all the boys are like, you know, Archie? where's Archie? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not sure now. <laughs> You know, I spoke to the boys, but I knew I'd upset him, you know. Um, yeah, but it's um, good uh, good memories, you know. Mm-hmm. Good memories with the two of them. What about celebrating nine in a row? How did you celebrate? I was away on the I was away the next morning. Oh, yeah, away, Yeah, I know. And uh, it was um, too well into America. I was away, you know, so I never really got to enjoy the celebrations like um, like a... Like I should have went into town. Went into town. I can remember going back to Victoria's or something, going out. But I wasn't. I wasn't celebrating full on, you know. Um, so. Um, Why did you make a decision to leave? Um, at that time, because I thought we're either going to get the nine or we're not, and I never, I never wanted a bit like Walter Smith did the year later. I wanted to let the supporters know. I didn't want to get to the end of the season. Oh, we lose nine in a row, then I go. Yeah. Or we win it, and that's that. You know, I just said to them, "Listen, in October of '96, I said, that's me. You know, at the end of the season, I'll be leaving, no matter what happens. You know, I just wanted to be fair with them and say, look, no matter what happens, this is going to be a not a traumatic season for us, but a really high pressured season. Yeah. I mean, Celtic were a good team, Cadet, De Cani, or Van Hoy, you know, they had good players, you know." And I thought it was going to be a difficult season. And I thought, I didn't want to come down the stretch and making my decision whether we win it to where I stay or and I had opportunities, you know, to, to go. And an opportunity came to go to America and I, I said, oh, Zurich of Grasshoppers I could have gone to as well. But and I said, I'll go. And then two months after going to America, I knew I'd made a mistake. And then Walter just, I got... I what did Walter back. say when he told me you were leaving? Huh? What did Walter say when you told him you were going to leave? He actually, he actually didn't. Um, no, David Murray didn't think. David Murray just thought I wanted another contract, and just maybe more money for more money or something, you know. And Walter said, "No, no." And Goffey makes up his mind. He makes up his mind. And that's it, you know. He said, "No, nah, we'll change his mind." And Walter said, "No, he won't." And that was it. So I, I made my mind up that I was leaving. Come what may. And I did, and but it worked out that I came back in October of '97 and played another 
35 games for the club. Yeah. You know? And like should have got the cut. Should have should have beat Hearts in the final in ninety eight and uh should have got ten in a row, but never worked out that way. So um then went back to the States and then came back to Everton and played a couple yeah. of years at Everton, which was which was great. Last week on Rangers, last question. Yes. Uh, best Rangers team you played in? What a question that is. Yeah, it's too difficult to answer, Simon, because the two of them are different. The 88-89 team was a very good, physically strong team um, with uh, Gary Stevens, Terry Butcher, uh, Wilkins in the middle of the part, you know, McCoy up front, Mark Walters, um, Tre Trevor Stephen ran about that time as well. So we were very, um, uh, what's the word? You know, we used, I used to go out and say to the players before we went out, um, We'll very aggressive first ten minutes. We'll kick anything that moves. Just batter everyone, you know. Just win the win the because that no. was the only way that teams could actually upset us in any way if they won that physical battle. But we had the players that we could we could dominate in that way as well. So we used to go out and then and then play, and we were very strong. Then the ninety four, ninety five, ninety six. You know, 95, 96, 96, 97 with Gascoigne and Loudrup and players like that. And then we changed the way we played a wee bit, you know. And that was also a fantastic entertainment, entertaining team to yeah. watch, you know. And we played the three at the back and people just bombing forward and, you know, David Robertson on one side, you know. So it was it was a, a really good style of football that as well, you know. You know, and, and with um, Haightley and McCoist at their best as well, you know. Mm. So, um, between those two teams but over the period of the 10 years or 11 years I played at Rangers played with so many good players um, it's really difficult to pick out a team because we won I mean I won won 18 trophies there you know, so we just dominated you know most of the you know so very fun time and then yeah, just yeah. the last bit on Evan uh, Evan's oldest ever player yeah I didn't know that just till recently and um, uh you know, Everton was good because it was a city very much like Glasgow that um, had two big football teams and they know their football. So the Glasgow people, I always think, know their football. And the, the Scousers know their football as well. Yeah. They used to see Similar good players. Thoughts, they? Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, uh, you know, we're so used to seeing good football players here. So we know good football players, you know. So, um, But the difference in the city was obviously, now it's okay. You know, Celtic supporters are okay now with me when I'm not playing, so I'm mm. not a threat. It's fine to come up, oh, he was some player, I hated you when you played, blah, 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 you know. So, But Liverpool, when I played there, at Everton, they would come up and go, Ever Liverpool players, Liverpool people would come up and say, shit, you must have been some player when you were 27, if you like, like this Dude, now. Not, uh, yeah, but I had, but at 38, I had one of my best seasons because I was reproving myself, you know. You have to reprove yourself, you know, when you move to a club, they, I mean, they, the articles before when Walter Smith signed me um, was, um, why are we signing Richard Goff? At 37, who's, uh -huh. at 37 <clears throat> 38. I mean, you know, he was a good player, blah, blah, blah. But then when I went to pre-season, I smashed everyone in pre-season. Well, you were the first at that age, were you? Yeah, yeah, still, yeah. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was fit boy, so I could always do that, no problem. So, and then our first game was against Manchester United. We had just won the... Premier League. Oh, the European? Yes. European so Cup. So they just won the treble. Yeah. The first game. So, um, and I played really well. I was like, so, and that was it. I was off. Flying for Nana. Flying. Yeah, I was flying. And I played, in, I played, I played in, a, in a back four, you know, because everyone said, oh, everyone always used to say, you know, Rangers, you would change the three because to, to protect to protect me, it wasn't to protect me, it was to protect, just to, so Gascoigne and Loudrup could get the ball in, in certain yeah. areas, you know? So, who, Mr. Ferguson? Alex Ferguson, what did yeah, he say? Yeah, yeah, no, he was, he was great. And then when, when I had the good season with Everton, um, like I said, I've never had an agent, but I phoned him up and I said, look, they want to give me another year's contract because Walter had nothing to do with it, you know? Um, and he just asked me what I was on at the moment and he just told me what to get and I said, nah, they'll never do that. And he went, they will. So, knows every day. <laughs> so I went in to, to talk to the, the guys at Everton, the chief exec and the, the thing, and he, and he said to me, um, 
what a pleasure it is in this day and age, Richard, dealing with a player who hasn't got an agent. I says, um, it was the chairman of Littlewoods, it was, you know, Sir John Moore. And I went, I said, I've got, I've got an advisor there. And he went, who's that? I said, sorry, Alex Ferguson. <laughs> and they just laughed, the two of them laughed. What do you want? I went, I went there it is. And I walked out. That's what Ferguson told me to do. Just walked out. They phoned me about three weeks later. I said, done deal. Done. What a man. Do you remember, yeah. we've got uh, we've got him on the show, but Tom, Thomas Gravison. I thought he was in the reserves with me to say, yes. mad, was he a madman when you were ever? Yes, he came. I was in my <laughs> yes. second season. That was completely nuts. <laughs> And then he went away to Vegas and uh, made, made uh, fortunes. Uh, well, so he said, you know what I mean? I don't know if it was made fortunes or lost fortunes. But he was a crazy boy, yeah. He was a crazy boy. Did you, you? So he would obviously play in front of you and he would just run a bit like a stolen motor, did yeah, you? Yeah, he, he was a strange player. He was a strange... I wouldn't have said he was one of the best players I played with, but a lot of energy and stuff like yeah. that. But, yeah, crazy. And then Gascon also come to Everton. Oh, so he did, uh, yeah. Did he still have it as well? No, nah, he was struggling. Uh, was he? He was struggling. Really. But um, yeah, yeah. But I saw him the other day, like for four days up here. So and, he, and he's in a good, good way. He's in a good state, you know. So it was good, you know. Good to see everyone. Uh, lastly, had a stint manager Livingston. Never get back into the management. No, I had the, I had the wee stint, and the Archinox says it was his hardest stint in football. And when he said that, he said, "You're it's unlucky, Richard." And we did well. We, yeah, we managed kept to keep. Up. Yeah, I'd signed, we signed three boys. We signed a boy called uh, Hassan Kashul. I remember him. Southampton. Southampton, that's right. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, he was a brilliant player. Uh-huh. He, was a, he was some player. Uh-huh. And um, I can remember one day, all, my, all the players were going mad at half time. And he, and he sat down, and he had the big dreadlocks, and I think he used to smoke the marijuana. And that, you know, <laughs> and, guys, relax. I'll tell you what to do. Just get the ball to me and I'll make it happen, right? And all, the Scottish, all the Scottish boys are like, hey, hey, fucking school. You know, so we were, we were, we were laughing, you know. Um, yeah, so we managed to stay up on the last day and um, I was doing, two weeks before, we were trying to work out what we were going to do for next season, you know, to because we had a decent wee team and I said to the, I said to the chairman, a guy called Piers Flynn, yeah, big, Celtic, the, uh, big Celtic support. It was great. It was a businessman. Yeah. And I said to him, uh, you know, like we, if we can get four or five other players, we'll finish top six. You know, like because that's a difference. It's just it's about players. And he went, oh no no, I'm selling him. I'm selling oh. him. I'm selling him, and I'm selling him. I said, what? I said so. I said, well, you get relegated then. And he went, no no, we'll be okay. I said, nah, that's me. I'm done. done. And he went, um, he didn't think I was true. I said, no, I'm done, you know. So I said to Archie, he says, nah, waste of time, you know. So um, they employed Paul Lambert after me. He was the next manager after me. Oh, yeah, lost, Lambert, yeah. yeah, lost his first 13 games. Never wow. won a game for 13 games because he'd sold all the players. Yeah. Then he got sacked, like in October or something, you know. So um, Archie said you had an unlucky experience in it, you know, but... My kids were also in the United States. I'd been divorced and I wasn't going to see them. So, you know. You're never going to find a bird in Livingston. <laughs> <laughs> find a bird anyway, by the way. Oh, okay, I bet you could. Uh, just a last question. But sheep bones. <laughs> exactly. I'm the same. How do you look back on it all? How do you look um, back on the career? Proud? Yeah, fortunate. I played with so many good uh, players. Um, I was obviously a wee bit talented, but I made, uh, you know, I made the best of my ability, you know, by listening to to senior players, um, good senior players. Um, I always tell young players of today when they come to me for any advice, you know, I say, Scottish, we're, we're a strange culture in the Scots, you know, but I would say to any young player today, if you can make £100,000 a week or £200,000 a week, you know, don't drink anything, just look after yourself well, you know. And when you get a knockback, like I look at Andy Robertson getting knocked back from Celtic, yeah. when you get a knockback at 15, because no one knows a, a football player at 15 or 16, when you get that knockback, just uh, don't lay down. Just show them you're gonna you're gonna do it. You know, show them, give yourself another chance. Don't don't get, don't be defeated at the, the first knockback you get. Yeah. You know, because you will take that in <clears> football. You know, 
And you can't tell a football player. I, can, I mean, Archie Knox told me a story. They've seen millions of young kids and the only two, there's only two out of all the young kids him and Ferguson saw that they thought would be, that would make it. Make it. And that was Ryan Giggs and Wayne Rooney. Out of every kid they saw, the one sure. those were the two. All the others, Beckham, Scholes. They couldn't call it? Couldn't call it at 16. They couldn't oh. call it. So, so there you go, young kids watching. Young kids watching, just, you know, if you get a knock back. Keep going. Keep going. I mean, Andy Robertson's a great... Ev- You're no, another one with Rangers and... Oh, myself at Rangers, yeah. you know. I mean, but there's loads of them. I mean, mm. you, you see Roy Keane said he went there and you know, he lands up there, you know. Yeah. You, you see, because of that age... You know, you never know. You never know. But believe in yourself. You know, mm. believe in your own ability. You know, and you'll you'll soon work out. If you got if you if you're twenty and you you're not getting a game anywhere, you maybe not going to be good enough. You know. Yeah. But, um, um, but a lot of young kids now just there's no. I don't know what it is. There's Easily no, defeated. There's no. Yeah. There's no resilience anymore. Mm. There used to be a resilience. You know. You know. Especially in Scottish people, I think we're losing that a wee bit somewhere along the line. Um, but um, I look at Robertson and I go, "Good for you." Yeah. Because it must, it must have broke his heart to get released by Celtic when he's fifteen, you know. But he went on Queen Spark. Good, good for him. Right, Richard, I've absolutely loved it. What a guy! Thanks okay. very much. No problem, Simon.